Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the second day of the International Online Conference. Um, the, the name of the conference is called Inside Out and Outside In. It's an international online conference that is joint organized by Queen Surrogate Museum of Textiles and Faculty of Fine and Applied Arts, Thammasat University. Um, my name is Tweep, or you can call me Egg. So I'll be the moderator of the program today. So um, I think now we got quite a lot of participants already. I'm looking at the system now, it's say 40s. So that would include all the panelists. And I see some of the panelists here already. Hello, Ritu, hello, Pilup, and everyone else that I don't see. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Let me just tell you the event this time, it was held three days. Yesterday was the first day. It'll be today, the second day, and tomorrow. And the theme today is basically on cultural exchange in textile dress and related areas. Um, it was interesting to note that with the COVID-19, it's actually somehow driving us apart physically, but uh, online or virtually, we are more connected than ever. Like now, I can see a lot of you joining in from different places. And it was great that we are still able to share all the knowledge and experience that we have in the related field that I think we all love textiles. So welcome you all today. Um, yesterday, we had a very good panel as well. We're talking about the conservation. We learned about the challenges that they have in trying to conserve the textile in Bhutan and also how to conserve the textile by mounting it in the contextual display in Singapore and so also other very interesting speakers. And today we also have a very good panel, a lot of familiar faces that I know who are very expert already in their field of studies. So today um, we're talking about how um, cultural has exchanged in terms of textiles and dress and over time. And we are very happy to have four speakers today. Uh, we will begin our first speaker today um, with Ms. Ritu Seti. Um, Ritu will share with us today on her very interesting paper um, on four cases of how rich traditions of Indian textiles that has thrived over centuries are now making their new chapters in the contemporary world. Um, Ritu was the founder trustee of the Craft Revival Trust and the editor of Global INCH. Um, which is an online international journal of intangible cultural heritage. She has also um, written many books. She served on the several advisory boards, including the IRCI UNESCO CAT2 Center. And in India, she served as an advisory board for several institutions, committees, including ICH committee. Um, she's also the board member of the Handloom and Handicraft Export Cooperation and also at the National Museum of Man in Bhopal. So um, please welcome Ritu Seti on her topic today on Indian textiles, tradition, heritage, and its reenactment. Please. Uh, before I start, I would like to give my grateful thanks to the Queen Surrogate Museum of textiles for inviting me to be part of this very important international seminar. Since antiquity, India has been renowned for the making and embellishment of a vast range of luxury and utility textiles. Its beginnings trace to glimpses and interpretations from archeological digs to lithic sculptures, murals, and later on in time to texts Travelers' Chronicles, trade records, histories of ruling empires, paintings, and extant pieces, among other sources. Treasured and valued in India, these textiles were traded the world over. The skill of its makers lying not just in the extraordinary diversity of their aesthetics and their mastery of dyes and textile techniques, but correspondingly, in their ability to adapt their patterns, colorways, and skills to meet the diverse demands of their cross-cultural international markets and clientele. In its Indian Ocean trade, India's close association with Thailand 
extended from trade in sumptuous textiles for aristocracy to the elegant and technically proficient more couturian textiles, with textiles specifically crafted for the needs and tastes of their clientele there. With the vicissitudes of time, much has changed. And yet, even today in contemporary India, handcrafted textiles remain one of its most visible and creative traditions that continue its cross-cultural continuities. In the time allotted to me, I'm going to take a leaf from history to pick up a few threads that demonstrate these continuities from antiquity to the present by delving into four micro case studies of reenactments, renewals, and revitalized practices across ateliers and workshops in India that remain connected to global audiences and are adding a new chapter to an old history. A modern dyed wax resist hand painted on cotton pen work of Kalamkari, also known as chintz, was renowned for its beauty of its intricate patterning and bright, fast colors. Recorded as being produced in several centers in the south of India, these highly coveted textiles were prized within India and globally. Exported from the Coromandel coast, their markets extended throughout Southeast Asia, Africa, Persia, and by the 17th century to Europe and across the Western Hemisphere. Yet in its very popularity and fame lay the seeds of its destruction, as its immense success resulted in the importing countries introducing laws that ranged from the imposition of punitive taxes, a complete ban on its imports, to a draconian decree in 1726 France that imposed a life sentence to those wearing these painted cottons and a death sentence imposed on its smugglers. In addition, this craze for chips fueled the copying and reproduction of these sought after textiles. And by the late 18th century, industrialized production processes in the West had succeeded in producing machine copies of these extraordinary textiles. Not only did these copied textiles sell in Europe, but they were exported to other countries, including back to India, the country of its origin and innovation. This further decimated their making in the land of its origin. Our first real glimpse of the impact on the maker artist communities, subsequent to the substitution by Western imports of mass produced and machine printed copies is in 1897, from the town of Kalahasti, famed for the excellence of its painted cloth that had in times past been selected for exhibitions in London. And I quote, the Kalahasti cotton fabric painters whom I recently interviewed were at first afraid of me, suspecting that I was a commercial traveler on behalf of some firm and had come amongst them with the base objective of annexing their patterns for reproduction by machinery in Europe. They complained bitterly that British manufacturers had now copied patterns, which they and the Masoli Pattern block printers had turned out for many generations. Going on to say, the demand has greatly declined in recent years, owing to the import of British printed cloths, which are used as cheap substitutes for what we make. This resulted in skilled master artisan being unable to even earn a pittance. By the 1930s, the practice of Kalamkari hand-painted textiles had died out almost completely across South India. But interestingly, it was in this very town, now renamed Sri Kalahasti, that pivotal steps to revive the endangered textile practice were in initiated soon after India's independence from British rule. It was in the late 1950s that a training center was set up with the oldest surviving master artist appointed as teacher, even though he had not practiced this art for more than a decade. Seven students, most of whom were from families who had a tradition of Kalamkari were enrolled and taught the arts. 
This step rejuvenated the Kalamkari tradition with skilled master artists now actively painting and creating and innovating with design. However, the skill and knowledge of the practice of wax resist to create the fine white lines that delineated the patterning was lost. This pruning down of the process to save time and cost in the face of competition from machine printed copies had been noted in 1915 Imperial Gazetteer. And it is unfortunate that the master artists here in Sri Kalahasti have not yet been able to make a breakthrough in reviving this technique. However, all is not lost, as in an urban atelier in the city of Bangalore, an engineer come designer come artist has through arduous investigation reached levels of sophistication in painted patterning. Her explorations on this ancient technology has step by step recreated the process, decoded the wax resist technique of drawing molten wax lines, sometimes finer than those that can be drawn with a pen, through her development of wax recipes. The textiles in Banaras have been extolled over the centuries, both allegorically and in text. These glimpses continue through the ages to writings up to present times. Described in 1886 in a catalogue produced in the Indian and Colonial Exhibition in India as, in London as, the gorgeous and beautiful king cards and gold brocades from the looms of the holy Banaras command attention as the most effective of all fabrics shown. The continued sustenance of these skills was subject to the vicissitudes of time and the impact of cheaper imported machine made copies. In addition, the waning of patronage from the aristocratic and wealthy clientele, along with changing fashions, had a devastating decline on the demand for these technically complex, sumptuous and expensive textiles. Almost a century later, it took another exhibition to reverse the trend. In the 1980s, a huge international series of events labeled the Festival of India showcased the cultural and scientific achievements of the country, held in Britain, the US, France, Russia, Japan and other countries. Among its wide ranging presentations, were those that projected the contemporary textile arts. The state supported decade long series of interventions and exhibitions was the widest, most in-depth exercise conducted across India. Through its renewals of tradition, it can be credited with heralding change in the vast ecosystem of textile production in the country. Among the traditions explored were the brocades of Banaras that were specially commissioned from weavers and were a testimony that skills were available, just waiting to be awakened. Four decades later, the experiments and innovations continue. Though the term Jamdani was a much later construct, the flawed, super fine cotton muslins of India were known for centuries past. Although history obscures the exact dating, there is mention of them in the text of the great Hindu epic, the Mahabharat. While in the first century account titled Indica, the Greek historian and diplomat Megasthenes described the wearing of flowered garments made of the finest muslins in the court of the great Mauryan emperor Chandragupta. Over the centuries, texts continue to extol the ephemeral beauty of these gauzy patterned cottons that were embroidered on the loom by the addition of weft threads introduced by hand during the weaving process to create individual floral and geometric patterns that were nuanced by light and shadow and tones of transparency and opaqueness. This regard was mirrored in trade figures as in the beginning of the 19th century, muslins valued at the princely sum of rupees 50 lakhs at source were exported to Britain in a single year. Beyond the trade statistics, powerful uh, myths to swirled around this much coveted Jamdani that were described as woven air. But what lay at the very heart of all this myth making and the telling of these and other legends was that the muslin was considered to be the rarest, the finest and the most sophisticated weave of the Indian loom. And we know 
that the finest products were reserved for rulers and ruling courts. The clientele changing with the rise and fall of fortunes and kingdoms. And from the 16th century on, they included Mughal emperors and then on the ruling elite. Produced in both Bengal and the East and in Lucknow, Jess, Banaras and Tanda in Uttar Pradesh, like other textile traditions, the production of muslin was decimated on the subcontinent during colonial rule. And India, that had once been one of the great textile manufacturing regions of the world, had become a supplier of raw materials as well as a huge market for imported goods. Added to this was that with the decline of royal patronage, these epicenters of excellence contracted and barely any weaver families remained. It was in the 1980s, and I reference the Festival of India again, that the revival of this patterned and plain muslin took place. A range was developed, skills were revived, and epicenters in Bengal, Banaras, and Lucknow re-evolved. Yet one gap remains. The original species of cotton plant that produced the thread has been lost and is still in the process of being researched by scholars on the subcontinent. The Ikka textile map has a pan-India spread across its differing cultural regions. And while these very diverse traditions share technique, they differ widely in design, practice, usage, and custom. Called by many names in the subcontinent, from Banda, Telia Rumal, to Patola, for the purpose of this talk, I'm largely going to go with the generic term Ikkat. The first glimpse we have of Ikkat is from the geographic center of the country in the rock-cut caves, cave monasteries at Ajanta. Dated from the second to the fifth century, these large-scale mural paintings on the walls of the monastery constitute a narrative commentary on the Jataka tales and episodes from the life of Lord Buddha. In these murals I am showing you here, you can notice the Kotodian wearing of what clearly appears to be the Ikkat weave, in what seems to be a very well-developed tradition already. Further in the town of Puri in Odisha, the Jagannath Temple, built in the 10th century, considered to be one of Hinduism's seven holiest places, being a Moksha Puri, a place for the attainment of liberation from the cycle of birth and death. A range of different textiles play a pervasive part in the daily and celebratory aspects of the temple's religious calendar. One of these religious text, ritual textiles includes the donning of a silk calligraphic ikkat on the deities. Historical records of the daily diary of the temple state that in the 12th century, the great Sanskrit poet Jayadev made an offering of his devotional poem, the Gita Govinda, to the temple deity. The offering was in the form of a silk grape with the liturgical verses woven into it. This practice, then initiated, continues to date, with temple peace, priests commissioning the textile inscribed with the invocatory verses of the Gita Govinda as part of the deity's ritual vestments. Further south, in the Thiruvalur Mahadeva temple in Ernakulam, one of the most ancient Shiva temples with a lineage that goes back to prehistory, the murals painted on the temple walls appear to be in the characteristic patterning called the Patola. This prestige textile also had a wide circulation in Southeast Asia, being immediately recognizable as a symbol of royalty, power, and authority. Evidence of similar painting patterning rendered in several other temples and palace complexes exists as decoration, as clothing, and as part of the deity's paraphernalia. These traditions were yet another that bore the brunt of imported industrialized machine copies as many regional techniques and specialities vanished and uncounted numbers in the Viva community suffered grievous loss of income and livelihood. But for this paper, I concentrate on just one village, the village of Pochampalli in the Deccan region, where the Thelia Rumal tradition of square kerchiefs was woven. The name derived from the heavy use of oil or tail in the process of preparing the cotton yarn for weaving. Also called Asia Rumals, they were exported to West Africa, the Gulf countries, Yemen, and the Middle East. 
By the 1950s, the weaving had been decimated to just a few families who were barely surviving, and the socio-economic condition of the weavers could only be described as hand to mouth. But the next chapter unfolded in the late 1950s. Initiated by government, a pilot project convinced the weavers to extend their kerchief format to get that of a six yard sari to expand their market. The explorations went beyond tradition, pushing skills and techniques to the maximum limit of the technology of the tool. This drew importers, buyers, and design talent to the center, including the Japanese international designer Issey Miyake, who in 1983, along with a Miyake design team, worked with the Deccan Ikkats that culminated in exhibitions and fashion shows across the world. Design innovations continued and over the decades expanded to include home furnishings and yardage. The use of cotton yarn was widened to include varieties of silk with gold and silver yarn accents. And here I pinpoint just one exploration by the designer entrepreneur Shia Mahuja, who in the 1990s innovated with silk, cotton, and wool ikkats in the form of floor coverings and home furnishings. The ikkat map has had dramatic growth over the decades to, in India to become a leading center in the handmaking of single and double ikkats for urban markets and for export. At the grassroots, where textile making continues in these testing times of COVID-19, craftspeople are linked digitally and exchanges continue as we add our new chapters to this ancient journey. In conclusion, I leave you with some visual of these new chapters in cross-cultural textile exchange. These reenactments of heritage textiles adapting to cultural mores in the long history of a world interwoven through textiles. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ritu. That was really interesting. Um, and thank you for sharing us about all these three interesting cases. Um, may I just recap again? It was, we talk about um, Kalamkari work from Sikala Hasti. We talk about Jamdani from the Bengal area and the Ikat work from Deccan and the metallic brocade from Benares. Um, I think you, you, you pointed out really well because all these Indian textiles are just the living testimony of the global trade and consumerism history. And I once went to one exhibition and they said just Indian textiles just, you know, cloth the world. So it's actually true. And it's also very interesting to see how the craftsmen and also the academics were trying to help to revive all the lost technique. And, and at least we have some old examples that we can, we can rely on of how things were done back in the old days. But I think um, the new chapters that you may I just recap would have just presented. I think my, my three points that I sort of take out is that um, in order for it to survive, you have to, to find a place for it, you know, for it to speak, to showcase, you mentioned about different international trade fair or the venue where all these textiles can show themselves again to the world. And also the other point is they have to be able to adapt to the contemporary needs because back then they were used in monasteries to drape the deities, to drape the wall or to trade over centuries to be used by, by rulers. But now we talk about new design, new application. You know, they have to find the new needs in order to survive. Because at the end of the day, I think when we talk about all people who make these beautiful textiles, they have to be able to survive from socioeconomical aspect. Otherwise, there's no motivation for them to continue to craft. And, and the last pass you mentioned, which is very interesting, when you were questioned by people you were about to interview in Sigala Hasti, I think they know that um, the craftsmen, they know that they are bigger power in terms of um, manufacturing that can just take advantage of their brainchild. So, so somehow they were quite insecure when someone was trying to get the knowledge from them, not, not only in terms of the techniques, but in terms of design, color combination, and et cetera. I think this is also another issue that, that probably someone need to help them out and to make sure that 
whatever is that innovation will not be taken away so easily and um, brought back in their own place to compete with the products that they were making. So I think that's, that's something that I, I take out from your presentation. So thank you, Ritu, for this very insightful. Yes. Um, so we'll move on to the second speaker. I think now we cross the ocean from India to mainland Southeast Asia. We'll meet with Linda McIntosh, which is our second speaker today. Um, Linda will talk about um, her topics today is called Remembrance, Inspiration, Adaptation, Go Work and the Sacred by Tao David Nittakong Somsanit. Um, Linda is an independent scholar. He's an independent, she's an independent curator and also a research associate from Tracing Pattern Foundation. Her specialization is in Southeast Asian textiles their roles in the society. Um, she's also a contributing editor to Textile Asia Journal. She has curated many exhibitions and she has written many books already. Um, the latest one that came out was Threat and Fires, Textiles and Jewelry from the Isles of Indonesia and Timor. And also Arts of Southeast Asian Textile from the Tiliki Gibbons Textile Collection in Bangkok. Um, today, Linda will give us an in-depth into her documentation about the court embroidery work, Survival, um, whose artisan was Tao David Nittakong Somsanit, who is a very skillful um, artist. Um, in order not to waste more of your time, may I just hand it over to Linda to give you more detail on this? Please, Linda. I would like to thank the Queen Circuit Museum of Textiles and Thomasat University for the invitation to present at this conference today. The title of my paper is Remembrance, Inspiration, Adaptation, Gold Work in the Sacred by Jal David Nittakong Somsenet. Gold work is an embroidery technique, primarily couching or laid work in which different types of metal threads or a place on top of a ground fabric to form patterns. Gold work is thought to have developed in Asia over 2000 years ago. It indicated high status and rank and members of the nobility and royalty applied gold work technique to decorate clothing, palace furnishings, as well as religious items. Gold work served the same purposes in Europe for example, gold work was called Opus Anglicanum in England. The artist Jiao Sai Nittakong Somsenet was born in Bianchuan, Laos on August 28, 1958. He is a member of the Viceroy lineage of the Lao royal family. As a child, he spent his summers and free time in Long Prabang especially with his paternal grandmother, Jiao Ying Sen Yim Kam. She taught him the court arts, especially flower offering making and gold work. These are considered female pastimes. However, Jiao Sai Nittakong spent so much time with his paternal grandmother and other female relatives, he became a master of these arts in his own right. Here is Jiao Nittakong's family tree in regards to his patrilineage. The viceroy Jiao Sai Savana Poma was his great grandfather. His grandfather was Jiao Sai Kaman Bongko, who was a renowned court historian. He married Jiao Ying Sen Yim Kam. Their son Jiao Sompunit married Jiao Ying Kam On, and Jiao Nittakong was their last child. Women of the Lao royal courts also utilized gold work to decorate clothing, palace furnishings, as well as items they would later um, present to the Buddhist Sangha. These items included the ends of triangular pillows, monks' fans, the straps to alms bowls, as well as narrative storytelling cloths. Jal Nittakong created 
the monk's fan, as well as the storytelling cloth depicted in this photograph. These were presented to Wat Bafang on the eve of the end of the rainy season's retreat, or on the 1st of October. When Jiao Nittekong returned to Luang Prabang from France in the late 1990s and early 2000s, he often visited the temples of this former royal capital. Here he found various examples of gold work decorating religious items. On the left, we have a manuscript wrapper dating from the early 20th century, while on the right, we have a small storytelling cloth that was made a one quarter century later. Jiao Nittekong also discovered Buddhist narrative textiles that his mother and grandmother created using gold work. These ritual textiles served as inspirations for the artist's own gold work storytelling cloths. This example was created by his grandmother, Jiao Sinim Kam. Here she has applied gold work to create a frame to, which will enclose a Buddhist icon here she is separating sacred space from the mundane. Women of the Lao court also utilized gold work to decorate other types of sacred textiles. This is an example of a talismanic cloth or pa yan. Generally, a monk or learned male would write or draw sacred texts onto a plain fabric. On this example, we have women of the court using silk embroidery to create the sacred text. The frame or grid of gold work was added at a later date. This is a characteristic of Lao royal gold work. Generally, a composition is never considered finished or complete. Additional details can be added by others at a later date. Jiao Nittekong's mother, Jiao Ying Kam An, created this gold work narrative cloth in 1958. The Buddhist iconography includes a standing Buddha image flanked by two monks or disciples. All three figures are clothed in monks' robes and they stand on blooming lotuses. Monks' accoutrements also join the composition. We have a monk's fan, alms bowl, a spittoon for beetle chewing, as well as a ceramic earthenware vessel for cooling water. The sun and moon are represented by the rundles in the upper composition. And here we find sequins added at a later date, just reiterating the characteristic of Lao royal gold work in which a composition is never considered complete or finished and other items can be added at a later date. Jiao Nittekong created his first gold work narrative banner in 2006. He applied metal threads from France and India to red velvet and accentuated the composition with beads of coral and jade. The gold work was applied to a panel of Indian brocade. The Buddhist iconography includes a standing figure of the Buddha flanked by two disciples. All three figures are wearing royal attire, harking to the days when the historical Buddha was a prince. All three figures stand on lotuses and halos float above the three figures' heads. 
Jiao Nintakong has utilized the interlocking key or Lai Gajia to fill in the background. This motif is often found on narrative story cloths. The artist signs his work using the insignia of the Viceroy lineage. He never uses his personal name. The creation of this goldwork storytelling cloth pays homage to the artist's mother, paternal grandmother, and other female relatives who passed on the royal court arts to him. It is also a symbol of remembrance, remembering a past era, the former monarchy of Laos. Although the artist was applauded for his skills and creativity, Jiao Nitikong also met criticism for creating a ritual textile using luxurious materials, metal wrap threads, using a technique associated with the former monarchy. In response to this criticism, Jiao Nitikong set forth to create a ritual textile using non-luxurious materials. Here we have Raimi, Cotton, and Job's tears composing the storytelling cloth. The iconography of this example resembles other types of storytelling claws. We have the standing Buddha image flanked by two disciples. In this example, the three figures are wearing monk's robes. The nine tiered parasols are, that represent royalty are present. In the upper composition, the artist has included the sun encasing a peacock as well as the moon enclosing the rabbit. The upper composition also includes birds of flight with outstretched wings. And this is a symbol of a master or a master artist, Jiao Nitokong, as well as a high ranking royal. Jiao Nitokong is signed this example with the insignia of the central royal lineage or the the lineage of his mother the insignia of the central lineage of the lao royal family consists of erawan the three-headed elephant deity with the wheel of buddha's law on its back john nitokong has added a lumpabang style flower offering a pair of nine-tiered parasols flank the Erewhon. The response to the storytelling cloth created with non-luxurious fibers, Raimi, Job's Tears, and Cotton was very positive. This reaction instilled the artist to create a second one. Jiao Nitokong has replaced the image of the historical Buddha with another symbol, his funerary reliquary. In early Buddhist art, it was prohibited to pitch likenesses of the person. Other symbols represented the personal Buddha, which was supposed to instill remembrance of the Buddha's teachings. These included his funeral reliquary, or jetty, as well as the wheel of Dhamma, or Buddhist law. Jiao Nitokong has included the 15 Naga and Nuak deities that serve as guardians of Lom Prabang in this composition. Jiao Nitokong has also signed this example with his mother's insignia, the insignia of the central lineage. He entered in these two um, textiles or ritual items um, to be used for personal homage of his ancestors. Jiao Nitokong stated that working with the non-luxurious material Raimi was a challenge. This vast fiber is inflexible when compared to the metal wrap threads used in gold work. 
and thus took more time and effort to create organic shapes and to complete a composition. Jiao Nitikong always stated that creating art was meditative. And this additional time to create these narrative cloths using vast fibers allowed for introspection. He not only reflected on his own faith in Buddhism, he also reflected on his mission, his mission to preserve the traditional arts of Laos and to pass on this knowledge and skills to younger generations. Jiao Nitikong returned to gold work when creating his last four narrative banners. This storytelling cloth was commissioned for the Royal Textile Museum of Bhutan. Bhutan has its own storytelling cloth tradition, the Tanka, that is also found in Tibet. Bhutanese storytelling cloths are created using painting or silk embroidery. The artist was inspired by the Bhutanese Tanka and has incorporated multicolored silk embroidery along with the gold work. Thus, the silk embroidery is, is more profuse when compared to silk embroidery adorning other types of narrative textiles that the artist has created. Large compositions of gold work consist of several panels of cloth. This is the inner panel of the previous storytelling cloth now housed in the Royal Textile Museum of Bhutan. Here the artist has replaced the image of the Buddha with a funerary urn in the shape of Mount Meru or the center of Buddha's cosmology. It is flanked by flower offerings that are actually composed of metal, the gold and silver trees accentuated with jewels. At the peak of the funeral reliquary is a nine-tiered parasol indicating royal status. Birds of flight with outstretched wings are also a symbol of high-ranking royal as well as the rank of a master artist. The outer panels of the storytelling cloth are filled with gold work and silk embroidery. Two monks or disciples wearing royal attire pay homage to the funerary urn. The interlocking key, or like a jia, fills the background and surround a pair of nine-tiered parasols. Jiao Nitikong has also included in the composition the sun represented by the, by the peacock, as well as the moon symbolized by the rabbit. In the bottom section of the composition, we find the 15 Naga and Nguk serpent deities that are the guardian deities of Lom Prabang. These deities surround the Viceroy insignia, or Jiao Nitakong's signature. This gold work narrative cloth is Jiao Nitakong's latest. He presented it to Wat Bafang on the 1st October of this year. This storytelling banner consists of gold work on Taipei silk brocade. Taiwanese silk brocade is considered to be the highest quality silk, the type of gift you would give to an elder relative as a sign of utmost respect. The Buddhist iconography includes an image of the historical Buddha in the Brang Tawai net stance. It consists of the right hand crossed over the left hand and both hands are placed in front of the body. 
this stance represents the Buddha of Sunday in Thai and Lao Buddhism. It also recalls an episode in the historical Buddha's life when he stands underneath a Bodhi tree for seven days with his eyes open. He contemplates his own enlightenment while considering the suffering of others on earth. He decides to stay on earth to teach Buddhist law. Both the image of Buddha and the two disciples are dressed in monks' robes. The bottom of the enlightened one's robes um, has two waves. So this double wave is a symbol of Lomperbang Nansang style. In the top composition, we find the peacock symbolizing the sun and the rabbit signifying the moon. The three tiers of the palace symbolize the three jewels of Buddhism, the Buddha himself, the will of law, and the Buddha Sangha, or monkhood. We also find adaptation in this composition. Jiao Nittakong has adapted Prada technique, a technique found decorating Indonesian textiles to create the bodies of the three figures. Gold, gold leaf is affixed to paper, which is then affixed to the ground fabric. The artist has returned to applying the Viceroy insignia to sign his artwork since these textiles or sacred items were intended for public display. This storytelling banner was commissioned by several families. Jiao Nittakong has couched the names of each donor onto the cloth outside the framed sacred space. Thus they inhabit the earthly or mundane realm. The artist plans to create a new narrative cloth during each subsequent rainy season's retreat. This is one way he can preserve this traditional Lao art. He not only hopes for others to commission these artworks, but he also hopes others, especially the Lao youth, will be compelled or inspired to learn the technique to create their own ritual items. In the sacred space of the Buddhist temple, Jiao Nittakong is able to pass on or preserve the meaning or symbolism of the motifs decorating such narrative textiles. Carrying out the various Buddhist rituals related to the presentation of such sacred items to the temples, he is also able to preserve the symbolism behind these acts. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Linda. Uh, all these Zhao Nits work are extremely beautiful. And um, if you know, Zhao Nit is a very talented artist. Um, I have to say that when, when listening to this, um, we, can't, we cannot really deny that in, in, not only in Asia, but I think all around the world, a lot of high arts heritage were court related. You know, in the old days, it no. was court patronage, there was the system that drive the development and for the craftsmen to be able to perfect their skills. And just now when we have the sluggage from political changes, power shifting and all, um, I think in Lao is not the only example of how the symbols, the prestige of the old power were somehow um, buried away or being erased by the new power in order to prevent the, I don't know, the revival of the old power. And somehow I think sad, you know, because we are now here, all the scholar who are trying to study and to try to, to preserve this legacy. But this is something that not only happened in Laos, but I think Chao Nid did a very good job in trying to re revive it. And although he faced lots of challenges at the beginning, I think now his, his attempt was proved to be sincere 
and not trying to to go back into the political issues or anything, but rather to try to preserve this very valuable craft. Um, the other thing that I took out is that because um, Zhao Nid is a master artist, so he has a lot of fluidity and resilience in, in how he creatively works with different material, different techniques, try on different designs even. And I think that, that makes um, his work is very unique and that's a kind of um, for fine thin line for someone to step up from being a very, you know, master in crafts and also step up into the artist. And that's the difference. And that's how um, the end result can make so much value and command much more price in, in, in the marketplace. Um, but again, the, the other thing is the, the criticism, you know, I think when we try to create something new, so we always face criticism and it just, some people couldn't endure it. And it's just a barrier for, to prevent us from break away the tradition into the finding the new use, the new styles or the new context. And in this case, you know, the material that he was criticized in terms of using worldly material to, to make such a sacred object. But, but overall, I think it's, um, his work encapsulates so many things, you know, history, myth, um, and the influence and now cultural fusions of India and China. So, so I hope to see more of his work soon. And I, I, I very, you know, keep my two thumbs up for him for trying to teach this skill to other people and also to you for trying to document it. Because sometimes the artist doesn't document it himself, but he relies on the scholars like you to document his stories. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks. All right. Um, now we come to the, the third speaker of today, equally interesting. So um, from India to Laos, now we're back to Thailand. And now we're talking about fashion. So we have the third speaker for us today, Mr. Loop Utama. Um, Mr. Loop is an independent scholar also a curator and an Emmy nominated costume designer that works on film and TV industry in Europe and as, as well as in Asia. Um, his specialization is in 19 and to early 20th men fashion. And he also um, received the scholarship from Royal College of Arts in history of design and material culture program where he obtained master degree. Um, now he's working on his personal research project in Thailand and the UK in the field of fashion history. So he will share with us today his research under the title of Royal Preferred Style versus State Mandate Styles, Western Modernity and Crypto Colonialism, 1850s to 1940s. So please, please Mr. Lu, please welcome. Hello and welcome. My name is Luke Tama, and thank you, um, Queen Circuit Museum Textile, for inviting me to give um, a presentation on the development of Thai fashion um, style, um, especially within the, um, the female um, in the court during the 19th, um, late, well, mid 19th century to mid 20th century, actually. My lecture is going to span to cover about 100 years and looking at how. Western fashion has an influence in the, in, in the local fashion. Right, okay. So um, the title of my presentation um, is um, it's called Royal Pupil Style, State Mandate, Western Modernity and Crypto Colonialism. Um, this presentation involving the concept of modernity of 19th century um, interwoven with um, the concept of um, colonialism looking at how Western colonialism and self-colonization during 19th century uh, in Thailand or Siam at the time had influence um, in, in the development of Western fashion to local fashion. So I would like to start my presentation with this obituary of, of King Chua Lung Khan. King Chua Lung Khan was king who ruled um, who reigned as the country from, from 1868 to 1910. And King Chula Hong Kong was contemporary to Queen Victoria. So his reign and, 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 and Queen Victoria reigned um, 
overlapping actually. Oh well. Um, in this particular obituary, it's very interesting because its title reads The Reorganization of a Country Marked by Its Rural Dress, Sovereign of Siam and Their Costumes. So, my question is why you know, the foreign press during the colonial period you know, assume or presume that to be westernized or to be modernized is to adopt Western style or European style dress as part of, of, a, you know, of, of political um, um, configuration. So let's have a look at a quick timeline on the British anti-monarchy timeline quickly. Um, you can see down here, um, this King Rama V um, ruling just um, from the mid-Victorian period from 1868 to 1910, actually by the end of the Edwardian period. So the fashion style um, that I'll be discussing actually going to start from the middle period, Victorian middle period to the Edwardian period. And going through King George would actually cover the um, cover Art Deco period of 1920s and First World War and then Second World War. And what's really important or interesting about, about the Thai fashion change is actually um, before the Cultural Revolution of 1932, most of fashion style was inspired by, um, the upper, by the upper class or by royal family mainly, and then sipping through um, different strata, different social strata. However, um, with the culture, with the, the coup d'etat, which changed the political regime from absolute monarchy to constitutional monarchy. Um, during the Second World War, um, there was a nation building policy. And among those, this cultural mandate were dictated how Thai population should dress, especially um, follow Western fashion in the 1940s. So with this, um, uh, as I call um, state preferred style or state fashion, is actually had a strong impact and effect on the change of fashion style of, of, um, of Thailand. Um, you know, that, and that was the basic of how Thailand become more westernized. So let's have a quick look um, of the three listing periods which I'll be discussing in this presentation. The first period um, is from mid 19 to early 20th centuries. And then I'm going to be discussing um, Western modernity and colonial um, expansionism of, of 19th century and the concept of self colonization and, and the fashion of the Victorian and Edwardian era. And then the same period we're going to be looking at, it's after the turn of century to the 20th century and looking at um, the fashion change during the World War, the First World War, and the era of Art Deco, so 1920s, flappers period, and then the return of women's curved silhouettes of 1930s. And the last part, the third part, we're going to look at the coup d'etat of 1932 in Thailand and the political and um, uh, political um, and well, not political actually, and look at how um, absolute monarchy changed into um, constitu constitutional monarchy and, and how fashions of 1930s and 40s has so much influence in the change of, of um, Thai fashions in general. So, so before we start, um, I would like to discuss uh, very briefly of how Western colonialism in Southeast Asia in the 19th century was such a key pressure and key, um, such a key events actually that uh, not health at all actually that assisted or that made um, Siam or Southeast Asia um, have a bit of a turmoil in, um, in in terms of you know, colonialism. And in Thailand in particular, um, the king of Thailand, King Ramadan IV, King Mongkut, and King Chalongkorn um, 
use um, Western um, policy, especially cultural policy, to um, present modernity um, in, in during this period. So let me discuss very quickly of science modernity and how Kim Jong Long Kong employed different strategies, um, especially using the um, Western um, uh, material culture um, uh, within the royal court, and most notably um, Western, uh, Western dress and photography um, that helped to change, and also the Western bodily practice um, the new Western body practice like, like eating on, on the table, standing, standing rather than crouching on the ground. And this, um, you know, kind of Western notion of modernity that helped to shape Siam to be a modernization, a, a modernized uh, country. And within this, um, within this ideology, uh, Michael Hersfield, um, um, Professor Michael, Michael Hersfield, coined this new term, crypto-colonialism. Um, as Hersfield argued, it is a hidden form of colonialism by means of cultural, economic, and epistemological hegemony, even in the absence of colonialism in the country. This theoretical framework is thus employed as an analytical tool in examining how the adoption of Western material culture impacted and negotiated Siam political anxiety and uncertainty by the self-organizing process. So within this framework, um, by using um, you know, the self-organization um, process as, as a framework, we could see, as I will explain, how Western fashions influence um, what, because we don't have a lot of time, it's quite, quite only 20 to 30 minutes. So I will only be discussing women fashion, especially the court fashion or women fashion um, within the inner court or all female court and how um, you know, the, the fashion setting by the upper class and by the, by the female members of the court um, was adopted by others, um, these different social structures. So let's have a quick look at women fashion um, shape and silhouette um, of 1850 to 1940s. This is just a quick glance of how um, how Chelsea changed and it's actually um, impacted um, Siam as well during this period from 1850 to, uh, to 1940s. Let's start with um, the fashion of the mid Victorian period of 18 well 1880s in particular and this period is called the bustle period um, where the um, where the the clothing concentrated at the back and the skirt protect, uh, protected backward, supported by, by bustles, and the front fell flat against the body. Or this period um, is also called La Belle Porte um, um, in France. It's, you know, it started um, around the beginning of 1880s. So this is the this is the silhouette of the 1880s um, uh, dress in, in Europe or in the Western world. And what's interesting is that the Thai court, um, because the, um, oh, sorry, let's have a look at the bustle actually. So it's, yes, it's supported by the bustles. And this is some, um, some, exa some examples of the dresses during the era. Right, okay, here. So this is 1880. Um, within the Thai court, um, it's still a tradition of wearing um, two pieces of garments, the, um, the upper garments normally comprised with um, a piece of cloth called passerby, which actually to wrap around the shoulder, to wrap around and, and go across the shoulder. And also uh, uh, either panung or a piece of cloth um, it's about one and a half meter by three and a half meters. And then four at a full half um, and then at the front and pleated at, at the front as well in the shape of skirt. So this one way to wear uh, this, this type of, of um, textile. And the second type you can see here, a lady at Queen Sawamadana, she's sitting on, on the chair. She's actually wearing a style called um, John Graben 
where it was um, it was tight at the front in half and roll and then pull, push push between between the legs and then and then put at the back. Um, this is similar to Indian dotting. So so this is a typical um, fashion of the Thai court and the Thai people in particular as well. Both male and female wear jungle band and what you can see here um, on the left hand side is actually the queen actually wearing a long sleep blouse and also another piece of cloth. It's called parcel so part, but actually it's either a brocade or a piece of um, embroidered embroider brocade folded in half and then um, wear across the shoulder. This is uh, normally wear in, a, in an official or formal event and is similar to gentlemen's frock coat um, in the West. As you can see here in both, um, both pictures, um, she's wearing, um, well, this is passerby and this is what she's wearing, it's passing the pack, but actually creating the sense of formality. And this is a Thai um, female in general and in a different strata or even, even upper class. So it's very simple to piece of fabric or a very simple blouse as you can see here in the picture. So what we can see here, this is the hybrid style of uh, Western dress and the Siamese dress. Um, so as you can see here, um, the Thai royal court has adopted um, simply um, the blouse or the bodies of the um, of the Western um, 1880s um, fashion or dress, um, still mixing with a jungle band and added with stockings and shoes, and then adding a tie flower um, by using a passerby here. And the hairstyle is a short crop hair actually, and it's very um, very fashionable in the Thai courts. And this is an example, actually, this is not the actual dress, it's just the style that I would like to show um, to the audience. So this is quite similar style. Um, look at the, um, the arms and the, um, the details of the front. And in, but this one in particular, actually, with the buttons in the front, this is a typical style of a bodice of the, night of the 1880s in, in Europe. Sorry. This is another style as well. You can see here um, that the seamstresses or the dressmaker has um, inspired, um, obviously, by the, by the Western uh, fashion. And then another period, actually, which is um, quite um, predominant in the Thai fashion um, scholarship was actually the 1890s period, where the leg of buttons style sleeves um, came into fashion in the Thai royal court. So this is the example of the um, of the leg of mutton bodies. Um, some supported by um, sleep bustle actually because the, um, the the sleeve is so large and to help to maintain the um, this chair in the And these are images of Queen um, Sawa Paponsi who actually wore this style of upper garments. Um, mixing with both Panung and, and Panung Jongraben here. Um, but um, it's, it's quite beautiful actually. Um, this is also part of, um, of the political configuration, um, perhaps or during the King Rama the Fifth Reign, of how to present and represent um, Siam as, as a modern, uh, as a modern um, nation state by implementing Western, um, Western fashion within the Thai court. And also um, the full Western fashion, Western dress is also fully adopted. But we see this photograph of um, King Shalongkorn and Queen Sawapa travel to Singapore in 1896. Um, as you can see here, the king dressed fully in, in Western style suit of the 18th, of the late Victorian style, while the Queen herself still wearing the hybrid style of the upper, upper top, upper part is Western Evertonized, and the bottom part is, is Thai of Simon style. And this 
photographs taken in Yogyakarta in um, Indonesia, um, where the, um, the company visited um, um, Indonesia in, in 1896. You can see the Queen and her lady in waiting and both wearing um, a typical fashion of um, 1895, 1895, 1896 in particular, the labor buttons um, style has only came about 10 years from the beginning of 1890s um, and disappeared by the late, by the late 90s um, until the beginning of, of, of the 19th century, or 20th century actually. Here's another example of how um, Western dress was um, employed as part of, of uh, political configurations and also as a fas fashionable um, items as well. And here, this is another style of um, Western fashion. It's more freely, um, you know, a bit lacing. And this is um, the silhouette of 1897-98. So the leg of button style is already out of fashion. Um, so it's only the frill, the frill um, sleeves and a very small, um, small sleeve, puff sleeve actually, this remain. Then um, the Evolving period came in the late, um, in 1900 to 1910. Um, this is a, a photograph of a princess of, um, of Siam. As you can see here, um, the fashion of high necked fashion of lacing and long sleeve blouse or shirt waist, if you call it, um, was adopted. And also the chokers as really fashion, most fashionable um, jewelry pieces back in Europe. And you can see the mixture of the two together quite beautifully in, in, in these um, photographs here. And also the passerby here has been reduced into a really, really tiny piece of cloth uh, by um, actually what, what um, the, the lady did, they pleated it so, so finely and, and, and using the same piece of cloth actually, but pleated, make it look so small like that you can see in the image. And here, this is the, the late version of about 1910. So you can see from the sleeves that the sleeve is now gone to almost like a normal sleeves. But the blouse, are, but the blouse is um, not too restricted. It, it's more roomy, um, as per the Rodin um, um, silhouette here on the on the right hand side. Thai women um, didn't actually wear hats very very often. They did in my research, but in the photograph because in the studio photograph, so they did actually they didn't uh, they didn't wear hats. And some of the female members, younger female members of the of the royal family starting um, to grow their hair long um, as in Western, as Western fashion. These two princesses here um, grew their hair long. And some of the older ladies still have short, short hair, as you can see here, but the hair would start, you know, more voluminous. But still the same, you can see here, this is the fashion of the, uh, of the Edwardian period. Um, especially Queen, I, I believe that Queen Alexandra inspired Queen Saupa in this photograph um, of both pearl necklaces and, and, um, and uh, diamond necklaces, I'm sorry, I have a plan, and diamond necklaces. And also here, this is the, some examples of, um, of the Edwardian blouses a uh, beautiful lace work, um, high necks. Um, I think because this part of the fashion, because um, Princess Alexandra or, or later Queen Alexandra, um, she, did, she had a small scar on her neck. That's why she always wear, um, always wore um, high neck, high neck um, blouse also um, the choker to, to hide the, um, the scar. And hence the population and the, the popularity of the um, the high neck blouses. However, within the um, different strata or other Siamese women, the Thai women still wearing very, this very simple piece of, of textile. Um, the um, the passerby and the panjong ribbon, as you can see here, if if it's 
unofficial events are at home. People just dress like this. So when, when you know, a photograph needed to be taken or more official um, uh, events, um, part of Western dress was employed um, to be part of, of, of the costumes. You see, this is the population um, um, still wearing very traditional. So the Western fashion is very um, popular among the middle class and, and, uh, and, the, and the ruling class uh, mainly. Here, the, this is the second, the second silhouette. It's the, the turn, after the turn of the 20th century, um, this is the reign of King Rama the sixth and King Rama the seventh. Um, let's have a look at the women fashion of the, from the 1910 or 1919. This period is called teen period. And you can see how the blouse, it, the blouse, the blouse or the dress it has longer, longer top. Uh, it comes down almost to the hips and the skirts almost like a, like a tube shape. But again, within the Thai court, they only um, employ the top half or copy or adopted only the top half. Um, one reason why they remain a Panunjom Graban because um, many, well, large part of the Jong Graban wearing, they actually represent um, the, the class and represent the ranking as well, because some certain style or patterns was given by the court. So it represents um, ranking within the royal court. So here the, um, the hairstyle and the bandeau and the headband also very, um, very popular in, in, in 1900s. As you can see here, this is the, um, the fashion um, of the, um, the teen period, the early teen period, possibly around 1911 to 1913. So you can see from the dress here is quite similar and the sleeve is actually cut shorter and just come just um, below the elbow here and with the, the hair actually uh, a, a bit bigger and, and a headband as accessories. Here you are, this more um, style of the, of the, um, of the 19, 1914, 1915s. And younger women and children starting wearing um, longer hair as well. However, um, around mid, um, mid um, decades, about 1915 or 1916, this, the hair is um, getting smaller. It's actually partly because um, World War mainly, First World War, First World War starting in 1914, ended in 1918. And fashions could not be too elaborate. Things had to be more practical for the for the work um, of effort. So the hair started getting smaller, but the dresses um, you can see here on the right hand side is actually um, the dress of the period, and, and and the top half is copied or adopted by the Thai the Thai royal court, and the hairstyle is actually much smaller. And this another examples, um, and this fashion of 1916 in Thailand uh, during the reign of King Rama the Sixth. And this is um, another example. This is an actual dress actually. Um, I'm only sh um, show this image of a Western dress as as a compare a, a, a comparison. But you can tell the um, the similarity of of the way the the dress or the blouse was actually made and tailored. And this is about 1917 fashion um, with a separate you know, the, um, blouse, beautiful blouse. And the blouses are more, are not tight as, you know, as in the Victorian period. It's more roomy and more relaxed. And the sleeve doesn't have to be, didn't have to be a long sleeve. It now could, you know, could be a bit higher as well. Um, this is um, um, sailors' um, collars, also very popular um, in, in Siam within the upper class. 
then come the Art Deco period, the 1920s. This is the begin. This is almost sort of the end of King Rama the sixth reign. Um, you can see here that um, the style um, they have started to um, adopt it. Um, Panu or pa or pasin. Pasin is a piece of um, of cloth of of lower garments, a similar style of of the skirt, but um, but uh, it's it's indigenous products. Um, as you can see here, they start um, the Thai upper class starting um, wearing their hair longer, similar to um, to the silence um, movie actress in, in Hollywood in the 1920s. This is Mary Pickford, um, in the silent movie in the 1920s in America. And this is the Thai, young Thai ladies um, of the 1920s. You can see here the similarity of how Western fashion has now mixed and blend quite beautifully within this period of 1920s. And I had hairband and bundles come back into fashion. And the Thai upper classes, and this is the image of um, King uh, Bacharabut um, and his entourage, um, all of which was wearing um, 1920s fashion with a bundle here. And it's a time where Western dress is almost fully adopted. Women started wearing you know, a, 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 full, a, a full style, if I say, if I could say, um, a full style of Western, of Western fashion, Western dress. And this is also, it's quite a beautiful um, um, picture actually. I got this picture as, um, from, from an internet also of source. And it's quite similar to um, this style blouse of this um, Thai lady of 1920s. This is so like the 20s, it's, it's more square. It's, it's kind of long, it's not long, it's sorry. It, it's more square, it's very boyish. So the designers um, have adopted this as well. And here you are, this is more of 1920s style. This image of King Shrasharavut and Princess Pranantha Suvantana, and on the right hand side, King George V and his family um, in 1923. And during this period, we could see the equality of women's human equality because in, in Thailand um, during the mid 19th century, um, especially King Shrasharavut, he had um, many, many partners of spouses. However, in, in in the reign of Rama the sixth, um, the idea of monogamy was um, was introduced and practiced. And you can see here um, a Thai lady dressed in Western style or 1920s um, bridal gear, um, sitting in studios, um, similar to um, the studio settings um, in Japan and in Europe, as you can see. And this is the more 1920s um, fashion from an exhibition. Um, King Shalom um passed away in 1925 and his brother King Shadabok uh, ascended the throne in the same year. And you can see here is the, um, is the continue, continuation of the fashion of 1920s. However, King, um, King Prasatipa grew until 1930s. So um, the continuation of the fashion from the late Rama the Sikh to the beginning of Rama the Seven, it's sometimes almost um, unnoticeable because it's so similar in, in the look and the style. And the women's has um, start to, um, to be shorter, just, just, below the, um, just below the ears and also um, adopt the the style is the um, the sleeve had become more um, kind of shorter uh, and to, um, the dress not the dress uh, sorry the blouse is actually worn with uh, with patoon or or western style um, um, western style dress was also fully adopted with even the hats as well and this is photograph of um, private collections of some upper class family. And you can see here that um, they have adopt, adopted this 
a very 1920s um, old fashion. And this is some examples of images from, from the period. And this right one, so this is from the provinces. So even at the, um, the upper, upper, upper class um, limits, not, not, not in Bangkok has adopted the style as well. And I love this image actually, because it's, it's all the women's dressed in very 1920s um, fashion, but you know, the bottom half is Thai textile standing to this new, newly built um, swimming pool. And this is the, um, the expat of the Westerners who, um, who visited um, Bangkok in the 1920s and actually see that how perhaps actually with the, um, not just within the local um, interest uh, itself, but also influenced by, by visitors um, alike. And this is 1929, um, almost the end of the decade. Um, with the end of the decade, 1929, um, with Wall, Wall Street crash um, in New York, with stock market crash, um, which plunged uh, um, the world economy into the Great Depression, did also have um, effect and impacted in the Thai um, political um, political um, events as well, because during these 1930s, at the beginning of the 1930s, um, right, let's have a look at um, the, the, the fashion. The fashion trends, you can see that um, women fashion start to, um, to come back into the, um, the natural female curves, rather than, um, you know, a boyish look of, you know, of a straight, a straight cut, Blouse and 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 a platform, a panoon. And with the 1930s in Europe, you can see here the waist has go back to the um, to to the almost natural waistline, and the skirt, um, the hemline is gone up to about half of the ankles. And during 1930, beginning the 1930s, um, in Siam in Bangkok, 1932, there was a, a revolution of the coup d'etat, which changed the political regime from absolute monarchy to constitutional monarchy. And during this period as well, that, um, that the Western fashion has a firm footing in the Thai, um, in the Thai um, society. However, uh, in 1940s, during the, um, the World War, the Second World War, um, there was a, a policy of nation building which uh, dictated or care, which had the policies called um, uh, cultural mandates actually, and what the 12 cultural mandates and number 10 um, dictated how people should be, should be wearing, especially um, Western style dress. So let's look at uh, a quick look at the coup d'etat that I already discussed. Um, this is a chair in the late 1930s um, in Europe and the hairstyle and how the hair is kind of longer and, and have more weave. Um, it's, and here this is Thai women and Thai men in the 1930s. I think this, this photograph is um, taken in America uh, at Howard Medical School in around 1930s. Because of, because of Western educated um, elite or Siamese elite who came back to Thailand, um, they brought with them um, their fashion style from, from Europe or Western, um, Western world. So this is how um, Thailand or Bangkok, um, some of Bangkok, um, the population dressed in 1930s, um, with a, some 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 of which actually um, is a mixture of Thai inspired or Thai interpretation of Western blouses, um, and with, um, with the local um, pattern of you know even a jungle bay you can still hear see here on the street, and these are some of the um, 
the Miss I Am um, winners of the 1930s. What I'm showing you here is just the dress style that you know, they have actually adopted 1930s style of fashion. And then the 1940s comes, came um, and the Second World War dominated um, the world with Thailand also, um, also be part, also part of, of Second World War. Um, but you can see the, um, the silhouette of the, um, of the fa women fashion because the um, wartime effort, the shortage of fabric, um, the skirt or the dress sets actually, um, it's go higher, so just um, below the knee. So when, when making dresses, it's actually helped to, um, to reduce cost on fabric rather than, rather than the ankle length. And during this time, um, Phil Marshall um, back Wu Song Crown was rule was the prime minister um, um, in Thailand during this time. And from the first time he ruled actually in power was from 1938 to, um, to early 1940s. And this is the height of Second World War. So um, Marshall Pibun Song Kram initiated the 12 Raktan Yom or the 12 cultural mandates or nation building programs. Um, which the most significant newness was to emphasize on the break with the past. So this is the time of Thailand um, came to be really modernized, to be a modern nation. And the name of the country changed from Siam to Thailand as well in 1932. So um, this Bratanium or this cultural mandate, it's part of of a new nation building program of a new Thailand as a nation program. And cultural mandate number 10 issued on 15 January 1941 consists of, of very distinct um, um, orders actually. Um, on the left hand side, um, it say don't, don't dress like this, um, stop dressing like this, stop wearing patrum nong chong of pasarong or an amend However, um, encourages people to dress with um, the Western fashion, as you can see from the left hand, from the right hand side here. Um, when when blouse, when more Western style blouses, men start wearing Western suits or separates that um, you know that that is um, from Western fashion. And also, there was a there was a, a policy of Thai women's. Um, or Thai men actually that should be wearing hats. Hats have become part of the um, of the, of the um, nation building programs and this mirroring 1940s fashion in, in Europe. And as you can see here, there are images of women in, in 40s style hats and in official um, events and functions, women encouraged to wear Western Western dress and hats as well. Here you are, some more. And now, 1918, because of this, um, because of this policy, it's actually the, um, the forefather or of how um, Western fashions penetrated Thai society um, in almost in every level of social strata, rather than copying from your own court. But this time, it's, the, it's, it's a governmental, it's a central policy for almost every member of the Thai nation to start wearing a dress as in, as in a Western fashion. And here, this is almost to the 18, 1840s. And this is 19, 1950, these images from the archive of Line magazine. Um, and you can see here that these images are was taken in Bangkok. And most of women here now, or even the men, um, look very westernized. And here you are. So let me... Um, let me um, 
put this together very briefly that, um, that um, this is how um, the um, cultural policy of, of, of the drug um, mandate number 10 has a strong effect on the change of the, um, of the local fashion as, as a whole or irreversible. And it was uh, cemented it cemented um, Western fashion within the Thai society until today. Uh, this will be perfect. Um, thank you very much. And I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luke, for a very comprehensive presentation. I think it's just so amazing to see all the chronology being laid out in terms of fashion and the development of the design, the women's silhouettes, the blouse and everything. It's very overwhelmingly, but in a very positive way. And I'm sure all our audience must have feel the same. Um, I think it's interesting to, to note that you use the word crypto colonialism. That's a new word we learned today. And I think it, it's more and more, and I think this word can still be applied today in 20th centuries when we, what, like um, involuntarily being colonized by someone, adopting iPhones and different trends from the West and still call us, you know, being independent. I think that's the word fits well to what we are facing at the moment. And the idea of using clothing as a political tool, it's, it's the very strong concept that, we can never explore, you know, we can never have enough of exploration on this topic. But to see how the authority dictate the style through propaganda to achieve that certain political goals. Like from the beginning, I know you, you mentioned that the kings and the royalty use this strategy to actually ward off colonialism to ensure that elsewhere in the world look at Thailand as a more colonized country. But then later on, the coup d'etat took over the power again, and they used the propaganda and clothing again to try to, to establish you know, their own power in terms of identity. And I think you see the same story repeating again. And, but but I, it would be interesting to, to, to see how this concept would apply in the modern day um, history, because now it's not really so much of the political tools, but more on the individual owns aesthetic choice as a fashion. And it's actually the same thing as you mentioned in your um, resourceful presentation that at the beginning, the authority used this as a, as a tactic. And then later on, the mass would adopt it and then modify them further and use as their own will, you know, in terms of a fashion taste. And, but the interesting point for me is how clever all these people in the past strike the right chord to, to actually adopt and blend all this to see you know, a very nice fusion of the East meets West. Whereas in, in those days, I don't think we use the word fusion quite widely as for now. Like now when we see fusion food, we think of it as something very pleasant, very interesting to try. But back then, I don't know if fusion was the word they use. Or in Thai, we have the term which is something very quirky of making, mixing different things together. So, but, but thank you so much. It was a very interesting presentation. Thank you. And now um, we move on to our last panelist today, Jackie Yong from Singapore. Jackie, you are with us right now. Um, Jackie is actually a curator from Asian Civilization Museum in Singapore and also the Piranican Museum in Singapore. Both museums are very good. and. She has just curated, uh, I think last year, there was a big exhibition on Guapai, on the Chinese haute couture, which is very groundbreaking. And also she works on an exhibition on the new permanent gallery of Asian fashion and textiles. She did also other different exhibition that also travel to elsewhere apart from Singapore. And today she will be with us to present her paper on Fashion Revolution, Crossing Culture in Chinese Dress from the Late Qing to 1976. So not to waste your time, let me welcome and give the floor to Jackie, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you again to Mai and the Queen Circuit Museum of Textiles for inviting me today to share about a project that we have at the Asian Civilizations Museum. 
Uh, the title of my presentation today is called Fashion Revolution, Crossing Cultures in Chinese Dress from Late Qing to 1976. So a bit about the Asian Civilizations Museum of Singapore. We opened in 1997 and the museum today tells the story of the diverse cultures of Asia, focusing on their connections with one another and with the world. Looking at networks and flows, the 10 permanent galleries are organised thematically rather than geographically. In general, we use Singapore's history as a multicultural migrant port city as a lens to explore the history and culture of Asia and the world with a strong appreciation of cross-cultural works of art. The three big themes in our museum are trade on the first floor, faith and belief on the second floor, and on the third floor from April this year, materials and design. On this third floor, we have three galleries for ceramics, jewellery, and fashion and textiles. The Fashion and Textiles Gallery is a modest size, but is the only permanent museum gallery space dedicated to the study of this subject now in Singapore. It is a very deliberate and conscious choice for ACM to use the term fashion rather than just textile for this gallery. In general, uh, museums in the West tend to use the term fashion for their galleries, while museums in Asia tend to go for textiles. At the heart of the term fashion, of course, is the concept of time and change for textiles on the body, and the gallery intends to show that this can be applied to the study of dress in urban Asia and beyond. We use the term particularly Asia in fashion rather than Asian fashion or fashion in Asia. Because Asian fashion, if you think about it, means that the materials, the design, the wearer and the designer are clearly Asian all the time. But that, of course, can be quite problematic. Fashion in Asia as a term, however, limits study to what is happening to fashion within the geographical boundaries of Asia. So in short, at ACM, we look at global fashion history with narratives that are centred on Asia. Due to the sensitive nature of fashion and textiles as a material medium to long-term display, the thematic displays in this gallery will change periodically. The items on display for our first uh, rotation is on loan from ACM's long-term partner and friend, the collector Mr. Chris Hall. And the title of our first rotation is called Fashion Revolution, Chinese Dress from the Late Qing to 1976. The moment you step into the gallery, you will see the three famous Chinese sartoria icons, which are the Ti Pao of the Republican period on the left, the Mao Suit right in the center, and the dragon robe to the right. The exhibition shows three themes. Number one, that Chinese dress is not, unstat is not static and unchanging. It reflects the context of their times and can be considered fashion. To emphasize this, the pieces in this uh, display are arranged chronologically. Secondly, Chinese dress is not pure. Rather, it reflects decades or centuries of cross-cultural influences. Finally, a sub-theme is the changing ideas of femininity and women's roles in Chinese society in this dramatic century of change. We begin the show in the late Qing period with formal wear for official occasions. Qing dress characteristics are shown here. A love for silk, a loose feet, generally bright colours, and elaborate weaved or embroidered surface decorations of naturalistic and auspicious imagery. In general, when the Manchus, a nomadic tribe from the north, took over Ming China from the majority Han population, formal dress was regulated to project power and identity. The rules of what one can wear in materials and design were recorded in the illustrated regulations for the ceremonial paraphernalia of the dynasty in 1759, or the Fang Chao Li Ti To show that they were civilized and legitimate, the rulers, the Manchu rulers, retain Han Chinese designs and their associated symbolism, such as the cosmological design of dragons rising above mountains and seas that we can see on these dragon robes. But dragon robes did change in Qing times and absorbed Manchu culture as reflected in this chao pao or court robe which was worn for the most formal occasions like sacrificial ceremonies and court audiences. 
the Manchus introduced new garment features referencing their origins as hunters and warriors. We see features like tapered sleeves with horse hoof cuffs, a curved fronted overlap, and also a round neckline. There's also a non-functional square patch um, around the waist area that was per perhaps originally used as a pocket to hide fastenings or a weapon. Qing casual robes were not regulated and they showed a lot of beautiful variety. This extremely fine robe would have been considered hip in its time because of its purple colour. This purple colour dye was just invented in England and imported into China not so long after in 1871. This uh, style of this robe would also have um, been in the style of Empress uh, Cixi of that time uh, because uh, she, her wardrobe in uh, the Palace Museum of Beijing uh, famously also ha uh, have many robes of this range uh, of pa pastel colours and um, many of, uh, much of her style uh, also have uh, motifs like this that uh, such as chrysanthemums and the show of the longevity character given her, um, her strong interest in um, longevity. The majority of people in China are ethnic Han Chinese and so are the ancestors of most of the ethnic Chinese in Singapore today. The Han Chinese would be wearing a jacket and skirt style rather than one long robe like the Manchus. This jacket would have been considered, um, that you're looking at now, it would have been considered trendy in its time uh, because of the exotic uh, embroidered steamships uh, that you see right in the centre of the row. That's, uh, I, I have uh, zoomed in a close up here. And on these steam uh, ships, you see Westerners on board um, and they are peering intensely through the binoculars, possibly at the other, which are the Chinese. I also love how the steam coming out from this steamship has been depicted by Chinese embroiderers very similarly to the way to, uh, they depict clouds on dragon robes. After the old imperial order collapsed in 1911, uh, there was an influx of democratic and western ideas um, into China and Chinese fashion changed dramatically in this period. Women became uh, active and visible in society and on print, especially in uh, urban cities. Shanghai became known internationally as the Paris of the East, and it boomed with modern architecture, public facilities, and a thriving fashion industry. The silhouette um, of uh, the ladies in the cities in this time grew um, tighter, and abstract and vibrant Western Art Deco and Art Nouveau designs became popular. And the preference in this period was for light and supple fabrics. Um, imported fabrics from Europe were popular and available in our new department stores. A constant fashion paradox was how Western designs and cut were simultaneously embraced by many as a sign of modernity while being rejected by others as a sign of weakness and subjugation by Western imperialism. In particular, even before the tea piles, the style that you're looking at here, at here on the screen was the rage in the cities, uh, in the Chinese cities in the 1920s. And this style modifies the Han style dress you saw earlier into a hip length blouse with three quarter flat sleeves and a rounded hem, and it's usually matched with a black skirt. This style came to be uh, known later on as the new civilized dress, and it was worn by new women. New women, uh, mainly female students and career women, and it evolved from student chic into a symbol of enlightenment and individual liberation in a new era. This is a picture that you see here of the famous Song sisters in this style before they became uh, much more associated with the later Tea Pao style. Here, we zoom in on two mannequins to see this lovely mix of East and West in design and materials. If you look closely at the uh, four black skirts, um, now there are two examples, you will see that they are far from being plain and boring. These two examples show a preference for traditional Chinese designs and include Han's style skirt features like pleats and um, hand, uh, floral hand embroidery. But, designs, but the designs on top, however, show strong Western influences. There is a border of red roses um, for the top on the left, and on the right, you can see that the top has repeated rounders of stylized floral patterns in early machine embroidery.
Tse, the Tea Pao, or the Cheong Sum, is con commonly considered as China's national traditional dress. But in reality, it was created only about 100 years ago in the 1920s as the latest hybrid fashion. Ladies wore the Tea Pao to be fashionable and not traditional. Tea Pao means uh, banner robe, or the robe of the Manchus, also called the banner people. Early versions of the Tea Pao, such as the ones that you see on the right, um, actually look like casual robes of the Qing period that we saw earlier. Another theory is that the Tea Pao was created in the 1920s by educated urban middle class women who were aware of the ongoing civil rights movements and they strove for gender equality. You notice here how similar in shape or silhouette uh, of the Tea Pao to the men's uh, Changshan or the long robe. Changshan is actually pronounced Cheongsam in Cantonese. So the term Cheongsam was originally uh, uh, associated more with menswear. Early tea pals like this were worn loose and with chest binders to create a flat chest. Interestingly too, on this piece, the Cyrillic script is possibly more an exotic novelty because it does not actually form a logical word or message in Russian. In this time, there was uh, actually a sizable Russian community in Shanghai. The tea pal then became the form-fitting shape that we are familiar with today in the 1930s as we see in this black tea pal. As the Republican government supported natural strong bodies as signs of a healthy nation, the trend shifted towards uh, tea pals that show off the natural curves of the body. New textile technologies and western style geometric and flora prints that you see in this um, uh, fabric here was also uh, more popular now. The lovely flowers here were created using a burnout effect that was invented in France and became popular in China soon after in the 1920s. This example shows how by the 1950s, tea pals followed um, Western tailoring and was constructed with duds to give shape, especially at the bust. Instead of flora uh, buttons, these tea pals have a zipper on the side. Sleeves are cut separately uh, from the shoulders. It was also worn with a bra to emphasize the, uh, the bust. This tea pal was made with swiftly lace, a machine-made lace uh, invented in Switzerland. The unwanted parts of the design, which in this case in between the flowers, are dissolved away in a chemical bath. This is a photo of the celebrity Le Di in the 1950s wearing uh, a chong sang. The a tea pal. A fun fact uh, is uh, how for this exhibition is the way that we shape the mannequins in this uh, section. Working with our conservators, we make sure that this tea pal mannequin, uh, the bust, actually reflects the dr drastic changes over 30 years uh, to the Chinese female uh, body silhouette. So the mannequin for the 1920s, as mentioned earlier, has a flat chest. And in the 30s, um, it was meant to reflect uh, natural hang hanging breasts, uh, while the chest for this 50s tea pao, uh, we made it to, we shape it to look like uh, it is uh, supported by a modern bra that is uh, much more similar uh, to the way it looks today. Finally, we enter the third section of the exhibition, which is um, the Mao China period. Under the leadership of Mao Zedong, ideals of an equal communist society swept throughout China, especially during the Cultural Revolution from 1967, 66 to 1976. Working class revolutionary spirit and the desire to not stand up for one's safety led people to wear similar simple undecorated clothes in the three old colors of blue, green and grey. Women and men were considered equal, with skirts and dresses being considered vain and unnecessary. Over here, we see um, a Mao suit as it's called in, uh, in the West, or Zhongshan Zhuang as it's called in China. The Chinese name reflects how uh, Sun Yat-sen, and there's a photo of him in white um, here, um, the father of the Republic of Modern China, how he likely created this uh, symbolic design. Mao, uh, Mao Zedong likely to want to inherit um, Sun Zhongshan's uh, legitimacy copied this style with minor adjustments. The suit that you see here has a label of the same company, the Hongdu company, that produced Mao's uh, Mao suit. This national dress uh, was originally actually inspired by suits worn in Japan and by the overseas Chinese in Southeast Asia with incorporations of Western military dress. 
Um, in summary, then, the, uh, I would say that the exhibition here, um, the selection and the narrative focus very strongly on the global influences in creating the beautiful styles that we consider uh, Chinese today. A short note about methodology, uh, of course, uh, this show is uh, heavily influenced by uh, the fashion historian Valerie Steele's pioneering work, um, China Chic, on this uh, subject in which uh, she and of course a team of fashion historians, they um, 20 years ago uh, talk about the importance of historicizing Chinese dress in, in this period that you could use the term fashion. Um, I, of, I also, in building this uh, show, I also uh, made sure that I looked at uh, sources, both uh, Western sources as well, very much um, Chinese um, sources. Uh, I think in particular, I think the Palace Museum of Beijing uh, um, has published a number of uh, very important works in this uh, area. And of course, also, um, of course, um, Dr. Zhao Feng's uh, uh, museums, Hang, the Hangzhou uh, Silk Museum, has also uh, published very uh, important uh, material about the Chinese perspective uh, on this time. So uh, I would say that while the subject is not new, uh, I think at ACM what we have done is that in terms of the selection and the narrative, we've focused very much about the, as I've mentioned earlier, the theme of time, uh, how you can, uh, in the, the, the narrative of the show uh, focus very much on what is new at that point of time and also how this newness derived very largely from the incorporation of uh, I, uh, ideas from other cultures. And of course, for this exhibition, we actually opened uh, just right before the circuit breaker or internationally known as the lockdown um, in Singapore. So uh, there were quite a, a bit of uh, new normal adjustments we have to make. For example, if you look at the black and white photograph, I think this um, uh, is uh, just a reflection of how the in the last week leading up to the, the opening of the gallery, uh, myself and the exhibition team, we were working on split teams. And so for the first time, we actually had to do some installation over the video camera. So a bit more to the left, a bit more to the right through the video camera. And um, and uh, a new uh, initiative we have at the museum, of course, because of a result of uh, the museum now trying to have more uh, digital initiatives to reach out, is uh, what you see at the top right hand corner. We have since launched uh, audio description tours for highlights in um, all the permanent galleries, including two from this gallery that we just looked at. Um, of course, this is to make cultural uh, experiences um, accessible to all groups. And uh, below, uh, that's, a photograph, uh, that's a photo of um, a gallery a highlights um, video that I did for this uh, gallery. Uh, all the curators at the museum, we did highlights tours uh, and put it online for people to be able to enjoy uh, the museum, um, even if, uh, if they were uh, concerned about it coming out in the early months to adjust to the new normal in Singapore and to bring the museum uh, beyond our walls to our people. Uh, what you see on the right is an image of uh, how for the first time our, um, our marketing team has uh, created this um, uh, AR experience of a 3D um, a highlight uh, scan of our highlights in the collection. So you could actually see them at home, turn them around right uh, at your house. And uh, to the left, you can, uh, what we have done, our marketing team has also done a comprehensive um, uh, 360 scan of our new uh, Level 3 galleries. Um, it's all available on our website, so you can actually uh, walk, walk, do a virtual walkthrough of the spaces um, in this year, of course, if you are concerned about coming up. So these are just some of the initiatives that are uh, new for ACM and our new normal um, in trying to encourage people to um, see our exhibitions in new ways. Finally, thank you again to the Queen Surrogate Museum of Textiles for inviting me to share. I had asked earlier if it's okay if this presentation is a cultural and stylistic analysis instead of a technical analysis of weaving practices, and I'm glad that they were okay. I hope that in listening to this presentation, you have seen how Chinese fashion crossed cultures in a dramatic century from the late Qing period to 1976. I also hope you saw how ACM uh, tried in this year, in this new normal, to present this exhibition beyond our walls. Thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to hearing your comments. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Jackie. Um, 
I, I'm so jealous about Singaporean people who have to, to have such a high tech, you know, museum that you can actually almost enjoy the very same experience, although you're not physically there at the museum during this time. Uh, I have to say, I like the, the, how you curate everything to juxtapose the Qing dragon robe with the Xi Pao and also the Mao uniform. Because I think not many people know, I think we are in the academic world of doing all these textile things. So, so a lot of things we are all familiar already. But if you think about people walking into the museum and they have no idea how much, you know, and how far fashion has gone through. And, and now what people understand in terms of fashion and the development is so far distant from, from where it originates. And I think this would be a good way to link them back to see how, you know, a lot of things that they, they, they wear today have Chinese influence in it. And then do they know Mao Su? Do they know the Chinese robe and how important it is? Or people talk so loosely about Ji Pao, but do they actually know where is it from and how it has developed? So I think that that was really great, you know. And especially in Singapore, where the influence of Chinese culture is 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 very apparent, you know, but people just know that it's there, or people know it actually from when they look at the artifact or something that they use nowadays. I think that's that's important. And you also talk about the incorporation of the, the outside or Western influence to be exact. And it's just another sign of, of how the world was opening up something similar to Thailand as well. And you see a little bit of Laos, you know, where when, when all the people start to go to Europe and come back and also in India as well. So it's, I think the, to me personally, the, the first half of the 20th century, the pre-war period was something very interesting because at that time, the world is really opening up from the first time with the improved transportation and the globalization become you know, much faster than before. I'm not, I'm not talking about today where we have high-speed internet, but back then, you know, so you see a lot of changes and different development happening at that time. Um, but just to, to conclude everything today, I, I enjoy all four presentation immensely. I just want to say that um, textiles are really the, the, the relics and embodiment of the cultural exchange over time. And now with all your knowledge and presentation, we're looking at them through a different magnifying glass from the political perspective, from socioeconomical perspective, or from historical or even technical perspective. So I, I, I hope this continue to be our legacy and heritage that we cherish and protect, but not in terms of how to keep the old things, but how to make it to have a new chapter in the contemporary world. And I hope it's, our, it's the job of the academics like us all, you know, to, to research them more from history perspective, from techniques or from different other perspective to bring out more insights to people at the public to enjoy. Um, right now, I'm just gonna go into the Q&A session. Um, we have some, some question here that has been posed. Um, here they said to all the panelists, so whoever want to, to answer this, you know, um, by all means. Um, as a researcher, a specialist, curator of cross-culture, how do you all see COVID-19 affect the creation of textiles and fashion in the future? I think it's very timely, this question. Anyone would like to go first, please feel free. Um, for me, um, because I work in the film industry, um, it has um, affects so much in terms of um, organizing um, you know, the, the, the design and how we actually film during, during the filming period. So that affects me professionally, actually. And we have to plan Thing properly, you know, with um, with wearing masks in spring, and even the research process. Instead of be able to go into the um, to to the proper place or to um, to the archives, we do a lot do a lot more of internet searching, which is actually quite beneficial. So it had its you know its good and a bad effects. Thank you. Anyone else would like to to add on, please, Ritu. Uh, well, in India, it has had. Uh a huge impact because we had a very sudden lockdown and therefore people were completely unprepared. 
as a result of which they were unable to get in the raw materials they required for their weaving or their block printing. So work actually came to a very abrupt halt. But having said that, on the other hand, we have a, quite an excellent digital footprint across the country. And most people have smartphones, at least large numbers of artisans have smartphones. So they continue to stay in touch through digital technology. So we knew what was happening in the field. But like Lukt has said, for academics and for others, it has stopped to an extent our research. And as you can see, instead of all of us meeting and conversing and discussing and actually bouncing ideas off each other, we are sitting so far. But on the other hand, we've had far more Zooms where we have connected with people we would never have met. So in every which way it has been very mixed. Okay, um, anything else to add on, Jackie or Linda? All right, but I think one thing for sure is that probably 100 years from now, all the academic would be so busy trying to research on how face masks would just develop to a great extent uh, during this time. <laughs> that, that's something we can be sure of. And um, also, if you, all the audience, if you have any questions, please um, feel free to ask. Um, I have some, let me see. Um, okay, there was some, an, an, a question to Ritu um, from Maria Friend. Um, she asks, could you please elaborate more on the revival of the wax resist technique at Bangalore? Do they use Kalam to apply wax? So that's one, one, one question to, to um, Ritu. Uh, well, it's very interesting you should ask this question because as it has been revived by an entrepreneur, uh, there is still some secrecy attached to the process. So, which is why the knowledge transfer from this particular atelier has not gone back to Sri Kalahasti. Mm -hmm. So, what I would recommend is that if you Google the person's name, you will perhaps be able to see more details. And while the organization I work with, we've had her as a speaker and we have interacted, I'm not quite sure of the details of the technique. So it would be wrong for me to give you an answer. But if you Google uh, Renuka Reddy, you may find more details online on Kalamkari and Kids. But I don't know exactly how it's done. All right. Well, thank you for your answer, Ritu. Um, this is just, just for me personally, because we, we see that um, clothing and textiles, dress and everything was used so widely um, from a political standpoint. Mm -hmm. It has so much power in a different aspect that, you know, that we all are researching and are talking today. But what do you see all of this progressing in the next, I don't know, 100 years as we now, you know, globalization is so powerful. And then um, more and more that people are becoming, they are, attaching themselves to a more of global culture rather than um, trying to distinguish themselves, you know, as a individual collectively as a smaller groups, you know, and then what, what would be the role of textiles? Like, I, I think in the old day, like it allows people dress up in a certain way to, to denote their own ethnic groups, but now everything is becoming so fashion, you know, yeah. and, and what would this be in the future? So I'm going to jump in again, Tweet, because this is a question that has actually been exercising me a great deal. Because my great research interest is of the last hundred years and up to the contemporary. Now, uh, in India, we retained national clothing and national prints and colors because we had the remarkable uh, experience of having Mahatma Gandhi as the person who led our entire 
fight towards independence. And he made the weaving of cloth and the spinning of yarn central to his mission. So cloth became a really powerful political statement in India. Hmm. So this Continu is Suso in India. Yeah. Continuing from there, the term khadi, which is hand spun, hand woven, became the dress of the politicians. Right. So the weaving and the spinning continued. In addition, people who were in the press a great deal wore national dress. They wore saris. So these were professional women. It was a prime minister. One, there were only two female prime ministers at that time. One was in India, Indira Gandhi. They all wore the sari. So it became the dress of the professional woman. Mm. But many things have changed. You're absolutely right. With globalization, uh, things have changed very rapidly. But along with that, I see a strong nationalism where there is a response to this oneness and that people are wanting to show their identity by wearing what we can term as a national dress, a community dress. Right. But what I notice in India is an interesting mix where they wear traditional prints, but in a very modern style. So you will see young adults wearing pants, jeans, dresses, but it could be hand spun, hand woven. It could be block printed. It could be painted. And of course, there is the other aspect too. And also dresses changing. As more and more women go to work, I find fewer are now wearing saris. Mm. Other very popular dress in India is the tunic worn with a pajama and a shoulder mantle. Right. And you will see that each one is woven in a different weight of textile because the shoulder mantle is always of a lighter fabric. And when you walk the streets in India, you will see people have dropped the shoulder mantle. Mm. So I, what I look at is therefore the impact on the weaver also, that what is happening to them that they are not weaving this particular lighter material anymore. Mm. So it's all complex and uh, complicated. And wow. I think we need another conference for that. I know we can discuss about this all day. <laughs> Thank you, Ritu. It's, you know, India is always fascinating, you know, in every aspect. Um, um, Anyone else would like to add on to this? I think we, we're just running out of time. Um, I took too much time, sorry. All right, it's all right. Uh, okay, so if, if no one has anything else to comment on, I have to thank you, you all, four of you, um, Ritu, Loop, Jackie, and Linda for your contribution of today panel discussion and presentation. I, I really enjoy it. And I think our audience online are having so much of a good time you know, to learn from all of you. Um, may I remind you all, the participants and the uh, viewers, that we all we still have the program tomorrow, the last day. And today we talk so much about history, developments, and different things. And then tomorrow, another theme interesting would be on new ways of teaching, learning, and presenting textiles and dresses. And I think that would be a good end of the three days conference of, of you know how to take it forward to, to kind of pass down all this knowledge to the new generations. And we also have the virtual tour tomorrow at the end of the seminar to of Ban Kampun Museum, which is in the Northeastern part of Thailand. It is one of the very best private owned textile museum in Thailand. So if you are interested, I think you can still register for the tour. And thank you so much for all of your time today. And if you have any more questions, you can leave it in the chat box and then we'll try to get back to you and also send the question to each individual speaker separately so they can answer to you. And thank you so much for today. Thank you. Thank you very, very, very much, A. Now. Thank you for, your, for moderation. Thanks. Yeah, my bandwidth is very unstable, so I keep cutting out. So I'm not sure if anyone can hear me. Thank <laughs> you to all for your participation. Right. Yeah, all right. Yeah.
All right. Yeah. Thank you, Linda. I, I, I heard all of your presentation. It was good. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you so much for moderating. It's great. Thanks. Take care. Right. See you. Right, bye. Bye. See you soon. Bye.